Good morning and welcome to Ms. Clark Reads to You. We are in Mitch Albums, The Five People You Meet in Heaven. We are on page seven and we are making book and brain and heart connections today. A book connection is when you want to connect with the book in a way that may analyze the literary elements. You might just want to say something with the characters, the setting, the conflict, uh, perhaps the vocabulary. A brain connection is when you are maybe making a text-to-text -text connection, a text-to-self connection, Maybe you are going a little bit deep into the text because it's challenging you. Uh, maybe you're resistant to something or it resonates with you. And a heart connection is when you believe that perhaps the book is changing a perception that you might have. Um, it may even change something you do or the way you think as a person. 26 minutes to live. Eddie crossed the boardwalk to the south end. Business was slow. The girl behind the taffy counter was leaning on her elbows, puffing her gum. Once Ruby Pier was the place to go in the summer. It had elephants and fireworks and marathon dance contests, but people do, did not go to ocean piers anymore. They went to theme parks where you paid $75 a ticket and had your photo taken with a giant furry character. Eddie limped past the bumper cars and fixed his eyes on a group of teenagers leaning over the railing. Great, he told himself, just what I need. Off, Eddie said, tapping the railing with his cane. Come on, it's not safe. The teens glared at him. The car poles sizzled with electricity, zip, zip sounds. It's not safe, Eddie repeated. The teens looked at each other. One kid who wore a streak of orange in his hair sneered at Eddie, then stepped in onto the middle rail. Come on, dudes, hit me, he yelled, waving at the young drivers. Hit him. Eddie whacked the railing so hard, with his cane, he almost snapped it in two. Move it! The teens ran away. Another story went around about Eddie. As a soldier, he had engaged in combat numerous times. He had been brave, even won a medal. But toward the end of his service, he got into a fight with one of his own men. That's how Eddie was wounded. No one knew what happened to the other guy, and no one asked. With 19 minutes left on earth, Eddie sat for the last time in an old aluminum beach chair. His short muscled arms folded like a, like a seal's flippers across his chest. His legs were red from the sun and his left knee still showed scars. In truth, much of Eddie's body suggested a survived encounter. His fingers were bent at awkward angles thanks to numerous fractures from assorted machinery. His nose had been broken several times in what he called saloon fights. His broadly jawed face might have been good looking once, the way a prize fighter might have looked before he took too many punches. Now Eddie just looked tired. This was his regular spot on the Ruby Pier bo boardwalk behind the Jack Rabbit ride, which in the 1980s was the Thunderbolt which in the 1970s was the Steel Eel, which in the 1960s was the Lollipop Swings, which in the 1950s was the Laugh in the Dark, and which before that was the Starbucks Band Shell, which was where Eddie met Marguerite. Every life has one true love snapshot. For Eddie, it came on a warm September night after a thunderstorm when the boardwalk was spongy with water she wore a yellow cotton dress with a pink barrette in her hair, and Eddie didn't say much. He was so nervous he felt as if his tongue were glued to his teeth. They danced to the music of a big band, Long Legs Delaney and his Everglades Orchestra. 
He bought her a lemon fizz. She said she had to go before her parents got angry. But as she walked away, she turned and waved. This was the snap snapshot. For the rest of his life, whenever he thought of Marguerite, Eddie would see that moment. Her waving over her shoulder, her dark hair falling over one eye, and he would feel the same arterial burst of love. That night he came home and woke his older brother. He told him he'd met the girl he was going to marry. Go to sleep, Eddie, his brother groaned. Whoosh. A wave broke on the beach. Eddie coughed up something he did not want to see, and he spat it away. He used to think a lot about Marguerite, not so much now. She was like a wound beneath an old bandage, and he had grown more used to the bandage. Whoosh. What was shingles? Whoosh. 16 minutes to live. No story sits by itself. Sometimes stories meet at corners and sometimes they cover one another completely, like stories beneath a river. The end of Eddie's story was touched by another seemingly innocent story months earlier. A cloudy night when a young man arrived at Ruby Pier with three of his friends. The young man, whose name was Nikki, had just begun driving and was still not comfortable carrying a keychain. So he removed the single car key and he put it in his jacket pocket and then he tied the jacket around his waist. For the next few hours, he and his friends rode all the fastest rides, the Flying Falcon, the Splashdown, Freddy's Freefall, the Ghoster Coaster. Hands in the air, one of them yelled and they threw their hands in the air. Later, when it was dark, they returned to the car a lot, exhausted and laughing and drinking beer from brown paper bags. Nicky reached into his jacket pocket. He fished around. He cursed. The key was gone. Fourteen minutes until his death, Eddie wiped his brow with a handkerchief out on the ocean. Diamonds of sunlight danced on the water, and Eddie stared at their nimble movement. He had not been right on his feet since the war. But back at the Stardust Band shell with Marguerite, there Eddie had still been graceful. He closed his eyes and he allowed himself to summon the song that brought them together. The one Julie Garland, Judy Garland sang in that movie. It mixed in his head now with the cacophony of the crashing waves and the children screaming on the rides. You made me love you. Whoosh. Do it. I didn't want to do it. Slash. Made me love you. Eee. Time you knew it, and all the shh, shh, I knew it. Eddie felt her hands on his shoulders, and he squeezed his eyes tightly to bring the memory closer. Twelve minutes to live. Excuse me. A young girl, maybe eight years old, stood before him, blocking his sunlight. She had blonde curls and wore flip-flops and denim cut-off shorts and a lime green t-shirt with a cartoon duck on the front. Amy, he thought her name was. Amy or Annie? She'd been here a lot this summer, although Eddie never saw a mother or a father. Excuse me, she said again. Eddie maintenance? Eddie sighed. Just Eddie, he said. Eddie? Uh-huh. Can you, can you make me... She put her hands together as if praying. Come on, kiddo, I don't have all day. Can you make me an animal? Can you? Eddie looked up as if he had to think about it. Then he reached into his shirt pocket and he pulled out three yellow pipe cleaners, which he carried for just this purpose. Yes, the little girl said, slapping her hands. And Eddie began twisting the pipe cleaners. Where's your parents? Right in the rides. Without you? My mom's with her boyfriend. Eddie looked up. Oh. He bent the pipe cleaners into several small loops and then twisted the loops around one another. His hands shook now, so it took longer than it used to, but soon the pipe cleaners resembled a head, ears, body, and tail. A rabbit, the little girl said. Eddie winked. Thank you. She spun away, lost in that place where kids don't even know their feet are moving. Eddie wiped his brow again. And then he closed his eyes. 
slumped into the beach chair and tried to get the old song back into his head. A seagull rah, squawked as it flew overhead. How do people choose their final words? Do they realize their gravity? As they fated to be wise? Are they fated to be wise? By his 83rd birthday, Eddie had lost nearly everyone he cared about. Some had died young and some had been given a chance to grow old before a disease or an accident took them away. At their funerals, Eddie listened as mourners recalled their final conversations. It's as if he knew he was going to die, some would say. Eddie never believed that. As far as he could tell, when your time came, it came, and that was it. You might say something smart on your way out, but you might just as easily say something stupid. For the record, Eddie's final words would be, get back. Here are the sounds of Eddie's last minutes on earth. Waves crashing, the distant thump of rock music, the whirring engine of a small biplane, dragging an ad from its tail, and this, oh my God, look. Eddie felt his eyes dart beneath his lids. Over the years, he had come to know every noise at Ruby Pier, and he could sleep through them all like a lullaby. This voice was not in the lullaby. Oh my God, look. Eddie bolted upright. A woman with fat dimpled arms was holding a shopping bag and pointing and screaming. A small crowd gathered round her, their eyes to the skies. Eddie saw it immediately. Atop Freddy's freefall, the new tower drop attraction. One of the carts was tilted at an angle as if trying to dump its cargo. Four passengers, two men, two women, held only by a safety bar, were grabbing frantically at anything they could. Oh my God, those people, they're gonna fall. A voice squawked on the radio in Eddie's belt. Eddie, Eddie, he pressed the button. I see it, get security. And people ran from the beach pointing as if they had practiced this drill. Look, up in the sky, an amusement park turned evil. Eddie grabbed his cane and clomped to the safety, fen safety fence around the platform base, his wad of keys jangling against his hip. His heart was racing. Freddy's freefall was supposed to drop two carts and a stomach-churning descent, only to be halted at the last instant by a gush of hydraulic air. How did one cart come loose like that? It was tilted just a few feet below the upper platform as if it had started downward and then changed its mind. Eddie reached the gate and had to catch his breath. <gasps> and Dominguez came running and nearly banged into him. Listen to me, Eddie said, grabbing Dominguez by his shoulders. His grip was so tight, Dominguez made a pained face. Listen to me, who's up there? Willie. Okay, he must have hit the emergency stop. That's why the car cart is hanging. Get up the ladder and tell Willie to manually manually release the safety restraint so, so those people can get out, okay? It's on the back of the cart, so you're gonna have to hold him while he leans out there, okay? Then, then the two of you, yeah, the two of you, yes, now, got, not one, you got it? The two of yous, get them out. One holds the other. Got it? Got it? Dominguez nodded. And send that damn cart down so we can figure out what happened. So I'm going to stop there and make the deepest connection all that this is a climactic point in the story. And I left off on page 15 and we'll pick up there. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to reading to you again.